Well, good day, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Did You Know Southwestern Montana. I'm Wally Felt, along with my co-host and our show's producer, Jeremy Crawford. How's it going, Wally? Good, Jeremy. And we have on the phone uh, one of my favorite people in the whole world, uh, a gentleman who uh, not only helped my form my radio days way back when, but also was in on fine-tuning my writing and continues to be my mentor in writing as as time goes on. He's a published author of his own, has three books published. Uh, He has a work of fiction. He has a memoir, and he has a great book of cowboy. Well, I guess it's not cowboy poetry. It's it's more just great Montana poetry. Uh, Native of uh, Montana by way of Malta, and Charlo, and uh, I'm talking about uh, Glenn Laram, who now uh, calls home in Austin, Texas, where he was involved in in the newspaper business and uh, public relations for the state of Texas for many, many years. And he has uh, recovered from uh, that nasty storm that went through Texas because Austin was right in the heart of it. And uh, good afternoon, Glenn. How are you doing today? Well, that about sums it up, Wally. <laughs> oh, we haven't even. Last got... week was uh, uh, reminded me of Montana. Uh, reminds me of why I live in Texas. Uh, <laughs> well, well, I never thought that I'd re- be referring to the winter of twenty-one as that hard winter of twenty-one being twenty twenty-one. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah. No, I survived. Well, that's good. And your bride, Pat, uh, did she make it through in flying colors, too? Likewise. I don't think I could have made it without her. Okay. Well, Glenn, the subject of our, as you know, well know, and I'll say to our audience, the subject of our Did You Know Southwestern Montana today is KDBM Radio. Uh, we sadly lost uh, the dad, the father of uh, KDBM Radio a couple of weeks ago. Bert Oliphant passed away, but uh, he touched so many uh, people's lives that were involved in radio over the years and we are going to share some uh, radio experiences uh, from the early days of KDBM. KDBM signed off uh, signed on excuse me July jet July wrong J January 1st 1957. I started my tenure in 1969 but Glenn you were there a couple a couple years earlier than that so you've got stories that I maybe haven't heard yet. It's possible. You know, the first time I ever saw Bert Elephant, uh, I'd heard him heard his voice on the radio. Uh, if you lived in Dillon, couldn't escape that. But a friend of mine was going out to the radio station to interview for an announcer's job, and I was sitting in the TV room at the college dorm, and he came through and said, Hey, you want to take a walk with me? And I said, Sure, why not? On such a short, simple sentence, your whole life can end. I said, okay, and uh, we started that four-mile walk out to the radio station there north of the, well, let's say the Club Royal. I'll pick a, a familiar landmark in those days. Uh, and while Fred was in talking to Bert, who was in the main studio, I was in the production room talking to Lee Bork, who was a, the professional announcer at the station at the time. He'd come to work there in 1966, and that was his job. Uh, he wasn't just a college student trying to find a part-time job. That, he was a, a broadcaster, wanting to be a professional announcer. So, I mean, he was somebody. And uh, we had a nice conversation. I don't remember all of it, except that I told him, yeah, what I wanted to be was a writer. Yeah, I was always saying that in those days. And uh, <clears throat> Fred and I uh, walked out of the station, hitchhiked to Butte, visited his grandma, and came back to college. And that next week, I got a phone call in the dorm from Lee Barker asking me if I'd like a job at the radio station. I mean, like, my eyes rolled up in my head, and I thought, 
what am I going to say to Fred? But I said to Lee, I said, sure, yeah. And so the next thing I knew, I was at the radio station and Bert was introducing himself to me. And <clears throat> I said, uh, what is it that I uh, do? He said, well, you would just work a shift, uh, start you out on a weekend shift. And they showed me the studio, and I looked at all the the toggles and the dials and the switches and the turntables and the tape recorders and the players, and I remember thinking, wow, I'll never be able to do this. Uh, but uh, then came the day when I could do it in my sleep. So that's how it, it all began. That's the first time... I ever remember seeing Bert Oliver. Now, let me bring this story full circle. The last time I ever saw Bert Oliver, I saw both Bert and Peggy. I was uh, working on uh, somewhere out in the field for the Texas Department of Transportation. I came into the office, and uh, as I came through the lobby, the uh, lady Judy behind the receptionist says, says you've got uh, uh, two guests in your office. I said, really, who? She said, Bert and Peggy Oliphant. Keep in mind, this is probably 2005, and I hadn't seen Bert since 1975. So, so I walked down the hall and walked in, and sitting there in front of my desk, sure enough, it was Bert Oliphant and his wife, Peggy. And uh, I sat down and... We had a great visit, and as you can guess, uh, kind of ran the whole gamut in a few minutes of our whole history together, but uh, I'll, I'll never forget that. I said, well, what are you doing here? He said, well, we were traveling through Texas. We were stuck in the state of night. I uh, had to do some work on, a, I don't know whether it was this travel trailer or an RV or what. But uh, we saw you on TV, and we said, we've got to go see him. So they drove the 85 miles out of their way, come up to Odessa. And uh, I had just, not too long before that, had a really neat experience related to radio. I had got to broadcast a beginning of a professional baseball game with the Texas Rangers and the Seattle Barriers, and I put them on tape. And uh, I happened to have one of those cassette tapes with me there in the office. And Bert said, do you have a tape of that? And I said, yes, I do. He said, well, we have a cassette player in our, our outfit. And uh, I'll send it back to you. We'd love to listen to that. So the last thing I remember was I handed him the tape, shook his hand, and and nodded to Peggy and told them it was really wonderful to see them again. They played such an important part in my life. And then he walks out the door. Uh, but boy, all the memories that that evoked at the time, uh, it was quite a nice uh, happenstance. 30 years later to have that experience. So he, he was an interesting guy. I have to say that he he uh, he overlooked all of my mistakes. And believe me, when you talk about rookie mistakes, I made them all, most of them twice. And he even occasionally looked the other way when I kind of pushed the envelope on the music. Uh, he had designed a pretty tight little envelope, <laughs> and I was always. Uh, try to work something in that uh, well you, you made it clear I better not push it too far but uh, when, when I went to work there uh, he had a way of building you up even when you thought he was holding you back and I uh, I appreciate that about him more than years go by uh, I hadn't been there very long and he sent me to Bozeman to be the delegate for the radio station to the Intermountain Network News 
radio convention, and uh, and then uh, uh, he, he was always pushing us to uh, find something that uh, the Intermountain Network News uh, flagship station in Salt Lake, which was KELL Call Radio. Uh, Jack Bogut was, had worked there at one time. He was the, one of the early, early announcers at KDBM Radio. And he was always wanting us to, to send uh, uh, news pieces to IMN so that uh, KDBM would get some uh, uh, publicity across the state. So uh, I, I remember doing that a time or two. There's a couple of stories on, on that end that I've told a few places, but... Uh, he he was a he was the kind of guy that encouraged all of his announcers to go as far as they wanted to and ready to go. And uh, I mean, they did. Jack Bogan went on to KDKA in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which was one of the great radio stations in North America. Uh, Jack Selway worked at KGO in San Francisco. He even did, hosted a few of the other room of the Hungry Eye with Ira Blue. Uh, and uh, then went on to a great, great career. Uh, Lee Barker was probably the best announcer that I've ever heard on radio. And uh, he worked in radio as long as he wanted to, and then went on to have his own kind of career, doing creative things of every kind. But he had the most creative imagination of any announcer that you could ever work with. Well, you guys... You guys had a an interesting show. Um, oh, in fact, yeah. in fact, it it was a show that 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 could have hurt me in more ways than one. As uh, <laughs> as I was on, as I was up high doing some work for my grandmother or my mom. I, the years have gone by. I'm not sure which one. And I was listening to uh, Town and Country. I believe that was the name of your program. Oh, and I mean. It was it was one of those whatever you guys did whatever bitch you did it was a belly laugh, and you don't want to do a belly laugh when you're on a steep roof. Uh, so, <laughs> I just I just remembered that that show stands out in my memory before I got into radio of as just being strictly a listener, and what a great radio show that was, and comparing it to shows, you know that I listened to in in larger markets as I worked radio. Um, it was it was a one of a kind, and and the listeners out there were were we bit on the lucky side to have that type of uh, entertainment show in Dillon, Montana. Well, it was a real interesting premise. It had a town guy who was very smart, sophisticated, and had a dry wit, wonderful sense of humor, and for the country guy, it had this young moron, <laughs> <laughs> and the two played off each other perfectly. Uh, yeah, I remember the very moment that, that you're talking about when you were up the ladder on the roof because we had just done a little bit and I, I had said something that wasn't even meant to be funny and, and Lee realized how funny it was and started laughing. And by the time I realized what he'd realized and I got to laughing, it was just devolved into bedlam there before somebody either stuck a cassette player in with a commercial out or, or put a record on or something. Otherwise, you probably would have fallen off that roof. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and, you know, that was only one of the influences that got me interested in radio. I was telling Jeremy earlier today or yesterday, uh, I was in the basement of my of my house listening to the radio as a senior in high school. And uh, whoever was on the radio was being was obnoxiously obnoxious. And I'm not going to say any names out loud, but I think anybody that worked in radio would probably know who I'm talking about. Um, it was just going on and on. And finally, I just said, I just said, geez, I can do better than that. And sure enough, <laughs> I, uh, I got into radio. I was originally 
going to go to broadcast school instead of going to college i was going to go to a broadcast school and we'd filled out the paperwork and and i was set to go to minneapolis in 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 the fall and uh, go to a broadcast school that specialized in uh, in sports broadcasting uh one of the facets and and of course me being not the stellar athlete that uh other people i know that was going to be my uh, way to stay involved in sports and sad to say uh it uh it, it didn't ha- it didn't ever happen because the school went bankrupt and they closed all i believe there was four campuses across the country and they closed them all and uh my mom the very smart woman she said she said well why don't you go to western for for one year and and go out to the radio station and uh, maybe they'll need some help and uh that they, they did There's a smart woman yes 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 she actually listened to the radio station and knew that we needed some help <laughs> <laughs> well there was always you know i mean the she she you know she in later years she she said something about my education she said if you go back and look at it you know you really in 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 those four years you were at western you really got two degrees you got a degree in radio or uh, in liberal studies and you also got a degree in radio because i worked you know right when i was going to college and uh and she was right you know i did end up with two two degrees and it was Radio 101, the real, real basics of radio, and I got to I got to tell I got to tell everyone about my training stories. Um, Glenn and another uh, fine uh, former Dylan KDBM announcer, Don Richardson, who now owns uh, Cattle Radio over in Miles City. He was they were my trainers, and they kind of intersected. Glenn was a a college student too, so it was kind of in between his studying and going classes being editor of the newspaper it's surprising he ever found any time to sleep and don i believe don was another one of those guys that was strictly a a radio announcer he might have been taking a class or two but i think his his uh main main gig was the radio station well so glenn would train me in the afternoon or on the weekends and don would train me early in the morning i mean they wanted you to learn every facet of kdbm from six o'clock in the morning until 10 o'clock at night when it signed off. I came there was in, an ulterior motive to that. Uh, it was so that you could pull anybody's shift. <laughs> yes. Well, my, 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 my biggest memory about that, um, you, I had to play, a, I was working the, the daytime shift, and it was middle of the road, and to people that don't know middle of the road in those days, that was like Andy Williams and, and Doris Day and Robert Goulet and and those types of artists, uh, the Jackie Gleason Orchestra, and uh, it was like a two or three hour shift. And and I remembered Glenn said we didn't have a we didn't have a set format set music. We had to play in a certain order, like you find when you get into the larger formats where you've got a playlist you have to follow. We just had we had shelves of albums and they were all labeled. And we had racks of 45s, 45 RPM records, which probably a lot of people say, what the heck is that? Um, But Glenn said, well, you get to go on next, because I'd been kind of over his shoulder. And he said, "Uh, what do you want to hear? And it was summertime, so I knew my mom would be listening to the radio. And I said, well, my mom really likes Robert Goulet. And he said, okay. So I go over there and I pick out, a, I think it was his new album was just there. And, and, and Glenn, with a, I don't know if he need, there's any Irish in him, but the Irish mischievousness of a leprechaun. He said, just remember, when you back sell it, it's not Goulet, it's Robert Goulet. Which I had already knew that because I had said I want to play Robert Goulet. But Glenn decided he would test me <laughs> so i get on and i play robert goulette <laughs> so uh you know glenn glenn had fun with me in the educational process don richards on the other hand though when i went into to work my third morning shift he thought i had been there long enough to handle doing everything that and it was mainly just you know news and country music and you'd throw in a farm report and stuff like that 
and uh, he said, are you ready to go? And I said, yeah. And so we had the, you know, we had the, the rack of spots in the order they were in spots is, is the radio commercials in the order that they were going to be played. I knew how to read the log and do that. And then he goes and goes behind the board, which if you remember the old KDBM, uh, the main studio control board faced the yeah. production room. And you yeah, out- slept there many times. Myself. Well, yeah, yeah. He took a <laughs> he took a nap, and I was on my own. <laughs> and and luckily he didn't snore. It would have been really interesting. And and then I learned that that that's kind of, that was kind of SOP for training early people is uh, you would you would let them be there for two or three shifts, and then you turn it over to them, and end up sleeping. <laughs> for for a couple hours until Bert Bert usually what he usually rolled in about seven thirty eight o'clock something like that and and yeah. and uh yeah yeah it was it was interesting but those those early days days of radio um you know we talked about before uh Bert uh had a try I think and I think this happened when you guys you and Don and were there is he had some kind of special tryout offer with United Press International's wire service, UPI, and he la- he used he did it right up until you know the trial period, and they said no, we don't we don't really need that. We get our national news from ABC, we get our state and regional news from IMN, and I do the local news. So UPI went away. What didn't go away? Was they a, left the was a, greatest yeah, like, like gift of all time. 20 or no, 40 boxes of UPI press paper. And it was this one, long, continuous paper because you fed it into the machine is, and, you know, the news would come out. Well, Bert, he, he came up with a certain size of it and then cut all that paper into those sizes except I think there was three or four boxes that were uh, um, the continuous length, because I think I wrote a couple of rough drafts to college papers <laughs> on that long paper, but he cut it up perfectly. And if you wrote a 60-second spot, 60-second commercial, it pretty much took up that whole little piece of paper. If you wrote a 30-second commercial, you wrote half as much, and he did all his news on it, and there was, and we typed all our weather on it, everything on it and i i'm not sure i left in i left in 74 and i think they still had another 60 boxes of that stuff stashed somewhere (laughs) well you know that almost is a uh, kind of a euphemism for the way that that he he was frugal uh he, he made everything go just as far as it possibly could I want to back up for just a moment. Your mom said you got two degrees, one in liberal arts and liberal studies and the other in radio. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Don Richard and I gave you the third degree. So. Was that a graduate degree? That's the third, uh, the third degree from Don Richard. Oh, okay. That's postgraduate studies. Yeah. 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 Well, Bert Oliver gave me the fourth degree. <laughs> well, I have, but I, I have a coming. I'll say that I have, uh, I have my own little uh, teaching moment from Bert Oliver. I hadn't been, you know, I had finally graduated from babysitting Don sleeping and learning how to pronounce Robert Goulet's name correctly. I got my very first shift on the radio station, first two shifts. I got them back-to-back Sundays. The first Sunday I worked from 1 until 7, which is when they signed off in those days on Sundays. And it was a hard Mm -hmm. shift. All I had to do was track record albums and see, this is the days, there's no CDs. There's no, there was cassettes, but everything was played off a phonograph record. And, uh, you know, you track these albums and you couldn't stray too far away from the studio because vinyl record albums have a tendency to get scratches on them and sometimes the needle would hit that scratch and then you would hear the same note over and over and over and over again unless you were ready for it.
so my first my first shift was the Sunday afternoon, which I made it through, you know, had news and sports at the top of every hour, and that was it. Went home, and I was feeling, you know, pretty proud. But the next Sunday, uh, I Sunday morning is an interesting type of a show because at that time, there must have been probably four or five church programs, different denominations or non-denominational church programs. And, and we had two reel to reel tape recorders in the control room and two in the production room. Uh, they had a tendency not to work when you wanted them to work, which both Glenn and Don had, you know, said, you got to be ready just in case. And they showed me, you know, I go in the production room, which could also act as an on-air studio if it need be. And so I had everything ready to go. I had all my programs queued up, ready to go. I was, I was ready. Despite the fact I think I was working on about uh, five hours of sleep, if that much. Because, you know, I was a college student. Yeah, and, yeah. and so uh, um, I put the first program on. It came on right after the sports, the Sunday, you know, sport, ABC. I remember Lou Boda and the wide world of weekend sports. And I started it. And I turned around to walk to go to the restroom. And I made it about four steps and they're real to real start going. So I quickly go back. One of the things they got read, told you to get ready is always have a record on and always have either a PSA or a commercial ready to go. So I was ready. I had it gone. So I, I quickly went in there and took the tape that was on the other machine and replaced it with the one that needed to play and got it going again. This time I made it all the way to the restroom. And as soon as I opened up the door, that reel to reel went out. So this went on to, to both the main control room and the production room. And I don't know if it was Murphy's law or Glenn and Don had rigged something. So everything was going would really test me, but you know, the frustration level of an 18 year old kid, when this is happening now, if you're in a radio studio, when you turn the microphone on, it mutes all sound. You can't hear any sound unless you have headphones on. So I uh, made the bad mistake of being really frustrated. And when I made my last this, I'm sorry, we're having technical difficulties. We, you know, blah, blah, blah. I left the microphone on <laughs> and I proceeded to you know, show the audience exactly how many four letter words I knew in my vocabulary. And I think I invented a couple ones and the phone rings and we had, we had the phone was underneath, underneath the, uh, underneath the what left side, Glenn left side of the control board. Yes. And it had a little a li light. Yeah. A little light. And there was a light up top that you could see too. And it, and I, you know, I, I saw it ringing. So, um, and I still didn't think about my microphone and everything else, but I had the program running. So that was it. I, and, uh, but it was started going again and I started saying, and I was letting the phone ring and then, and the microphone was still on. So people were still hearing my frustration and, and the phone kept ringing. This is before answer machines and stuff. So it just kept ringing. And I finally picked up the phone and I said, KDBM, may I help you? And Bert was on the other end. And he said, Wally, turn your microphone off. <laughs> That's all he said. I, yeah. I thought my radio career was done after two shifts. I thought there's no way they're going to let me back into that studio again. And the next. I think, I think Wally, that every one of us has that same story. Uh, maybe not quite in the same version of yours, but Jack Selway one time when he wrote some notes about his history at uh, KDBM radio. He was a 16 year old kid from Dillon who had created his own radio station in his, his uh, bedroom in his basement and then graduated from there. To, one of science will work with it. Graduated from there to go to work at the radio station. And then he went on to a real successful career in radio and public relations. But he said, Bert Olivant was one of the kindest men that he had ever known. And I have an idea that behind that is a story 
pretty similar to yours. Well, uh, it, it was, uh, you know, he just, I went out the next day, I don't know, pick up what I thought maybe was my last paycheck or whatever. And, <laughs> and I went out at a time of the day that I thought for sure neither Bert nor Peggy would be in the station just to kind of see what kind of smoke was still around. Well, I picked a good time. Both Bert and Peggy were in the station still. They <laughs> probably waited for you that and, day. Uh, <laughs> and all Bert did was he said, he said, uh, if you don't mind this next weekend, we're going to put you on Saturday night and Sunday morning again, just because, you know, uh, we just, we, we have to juggle some stuff around. And I'm, I'm waiting for him to drop the, drop the hammer. And I said, okay, works for me. And years later, uh, Glenn, remember when Bert started, started writing the, the story of the radio station, he contacted all, many of us who had yeah. worked for him over the years. And in our conversation, I asked him, I said, Bert, do you remember my first Sunday morning? And do you remember my not turning the microphone on and being very colorful in describing my frustration, he said, oh yeah, I remember that. And I said, but you kept me on. And he said, "He said I thought you would learn a better lesson by not saying anything more than just turn your microphone on than doing anything else. I mean, he said, I could have yelled at you, I could have fired you, I could have done all these things, but would you have learned anything? And I'm thinking, what a great lesson what a great radio lesson. What a great lesson of life. So, yeah, yeah, Bert, Bert was also a masterful engineer. Uh, Glenn, remember when, remember when the engineer came to kind of do a fine tune-up on, uh, yes. on the radio station? And he, he opened up the back of the board, and he looked at it, and he was kind of just shaking his head. And he turned around, and he looked at, I, I don't know who, how many of us were in the studio. I don't think Bert was there, but I think it was just us announcers. And he said, you guys been off the air lately? And we're saying, ah, not really. And he's just kind of shaking his head, and he puts the cover back down again. And then he goes back in the transmitter room, and you can hear him open up the back of the transmitter. Because in those days, the transmitter was just in the back room. And uh, he comes out, and he's got this weird look on his face, and... And I, I can't remember which of us or which. It was probably wasn't me because I was one of the rookies. But everybody was just kind of looking. And the guy was just mystified how we were on the air and sounding good with our signal and everything else. And we didn't have shorts in the board, except the reel-to-reels. He never they couldn't explain the reel-to-reels. Uh, <laughs> but it, it, Bert had... Bert had really done a masterful job when he went to engineering school. He they must have shot something. Yeah, he must have done. They must have shot showed him the tricks of what you can do it because the wiring and stuff at the back of the board was chewing gum and the cellophane, the tinfoil paper that came in the gum. That's how he. That's how he grounded everything. That's how everything <laughs> was put together. And this guy was, you know, and and I'm I'm thinking. I'm thinking he's saying, "Oh, I'm going to make I'm going to make a whole bunch of money repairing this." He didn't have to make any money. It sounded great. It didn't need to be because Bert would the only you know the good thing about that is Bert probably really upped the stock in double mint gum because I think that was his favorite. <laughs> Cuz he was always, you know, and 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 Glenn, how many times have you seen somebody on TV talking with gum in your mouth, their mouth? And remember Bert's rule? I don't care if you chew gum, just not when you're on the air. Yes. And, and he wouldn't let, he didn't, we didn't get to sit down very often. Remember we had the stool that we are on and we were supposed to stand and you were one of the first people that I learned standing up and it, you sound better when you're standing up because your diaphragm is in the right place. And Glenn was the first one, but when you, when Bert was on the air, he never sat down. And it, and it's it's I think Glenn maybe subtly he taught you that about standing up and you figured you know watching him do it because you said you admired Mr. Oliphant's voice and you figured well him standing up standing up and delivering maybe that's why he sounded so good. He taught me a lot of things. Uh, you know he was the first class engineer of the station and the only one. Uh, 
I think maybe in your day there was another first class engineer who came to work at the radio. Station. Might have been Rex Jensen, his his well, relative. Rex, Rex, Rex had been there and gone by the time I started. So he he probably was a first class engineer because he went to KANA in Anaconda when Burke bought that station. Uh, they bought that station uh, in. 65. Uh, but uh, all the rest of us, we had third class tickets, which were barely the third class radio. Well, you had that engineer. element. You had that element nine that remember you had. I mean, the first part of that third class license was easy to take. And then they made, then you had to take the element nine. And I was fortunate enough to pass it on my first go. But I know there were other people that didn't pass it, and I'm not sure if they had Element 9 in effect when you got your phone, your third phone. I don't remember that they did. So, but, but the, Bert always said about the FCC is, is the, the rules of the licensing, that, because now you don't need a license. You don't, you just get a job. I, I, I think that's it. I don't think you need a broadcast third or first phone. Um, like like you did Not then. To broadcast, no. no, no, and we couldn't broadcast unless we had one, and we couldn't yeah. be on we couldn't be on our own unless we had an element nine. So back then, everybody that was on the radio had to have a certain amount of licensing. Yeah, yeah, you had a yeah. you had an FCC test that, and what Missoula was our was our closest, wasn't it, Glenn? Where we had to go take the test, wasn't it, Missoula? That we had to go to. You had to take the. Yeah. You, you took the first. It must have. It might have been. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. Um, uh, it might have been. Might have been Bozeman. I might have taken it as Bozeman. Probably either either one of those because they both had campus radio stations and they and the FCC used to used to congregate with stuff like that around a campus radio station. And also, there's a lot of federal, a lot more federal offices in in. Uh, in Missoula and Bozeman than there are in Dillon. Dillon's the forest service at BLM. That's, that's about it. So, yeah. yeah. So, well, you know, uh, Bert, Bert was the first class engineer, but in the event that he wasn't there at the station, something happened that, you know, normally a first class engineer would take care of. Uh, he expected his announcers to be resourceful enough to do it. And, uh, he showed me, you know, when we had thunderstorms, Oh, All yeah. kinds of things. I remember those fun things. days. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, it was easy enough to blow a fuse in that transmitter in that other room. So he took me back there one day and he brought back a long-handled screwdriver with a rubber handle on it. And said, all you have to do is just pop this fuse out and then replace it and you're back on the air. And uh, so I watched him do it. Okay. I thought I could do that. So one day, storm came up station went down. I went back, uh, got the screwdriver, opened the back of the transmitter, reached down to pop that fuse out, and woke up sitting with my back to the back wall, holding a screwdriver in my hand. And what had been a 12-inch shank on that screwdriver was now about two inches of melted metal. And fortunately, I guess it was the rubber handle. <laughs> We're just getting not free. Well, they, I was still alive. They uh, refined that because I remember having to change fuses, and and I I thought I I thought I maybe it was a screwdriver. I thought it was a a pliers that you just pulled the rubber handed <laughs> pliers that you just pulled the fuse out. But maybe but, they maybe they did refine it. Yeah, after uh, I you, know uh, I called Bruce Thomas. He came out. I don't know that Bert ever knew that it happened, but well, it, it taught me an invaluable lesson. I call professional. That, yeah. Uh, <laughs> to me, it almost sounds like you guys got a lot of uh, learning or baptism by fire, which you know, in a way, that's kind of the best way to learn it. Is you know, if you survive, yeah, yeah. well, <laughs> if you survived. <laughs> so you know, I, I had talked about my first air shift. What I didn't talk about was there was a pre-trial run before I got my own air shift. And it was a little, it was a little program that ran from four o'clock to five o'clock, Monday through Friday. 
called the 1490 Request Club. And it was unorganized chaos because you were taking requests and you had to play the requests, you had to play the commercials, and it was heavily sold because a lot of people listened to it. And, well, I say a lot of people, kids, kids listen to it. And I can remember Glenn told me when I, when I was, when I was told I was going to finally get my 1490 request club debut, he said, it was almost like he was writing Frank Sinatra's New York, New York, because in so many words, he said, if you could do this shift, you can do any shift on this station. And I remember when I was done with it, I was just, I was like, I was wired. My eyes were probably as big around as silver dollars. This was, this was when, uh, um, if, if people from the sixties remember sugar, sugar by the Archies, I must've played that, that stupid song 10 times in that hour, because at that time it was the most popular song in the world and in Dillon, Montana, and everybody wanted to hear it. Ask your mom and dad, Jeremy. <laughs> they'll, they'll remember the 1490 Request Club. So back then, just kind of interrupt a little bit, was it just 1490, or yeah. was it both radio stations? FM, we were talking... 1490. Yeah, yeah, okay. I had just, I, I had just uh, came to the radio station a year after they switched from the 800... Uh, kilohertz on the radio dial to 1490 so that they could broadcast at night and that was to broadcast sports events. Uh, and the reason why they couldn't do it on 800 was because 800 was a clear channel Canadian Mexican station and if you did that after dark you'd be interfering with those 500,000 <laughs> clear channel boomers you know like uh, Wolfman Jack and and uh, so, so they changed it to 1490 in 1966. And then the FM and came. Then I came. The FM came. And then came. the FM came in 70. Yeah. That's, okay. Yeah, that's when the FM came. And at night, is it true that the radio signal goes farther? Because I can remember on, somebody one time telling me Depending that. on the, your, the strength of your signal. Okay. So it's 1490 like, was a weaker signal. If it had been 800, it would have been a stronger signal. Okay. It was a stronger signal in the daytime too, but uh, yeah, well, it's further you go up the dial. Uh, yeah, it's like it's like when I was learning how to be a a, a radio announcer, a disc jockey at that yeah. time, because you really were playing discs. Yeah. Um, both Glenn and Don told me to listen to other stations and see how announcers back sell, front sell, do the weather, do whatever it is, and he, they said write it down, and then and I said, well, and just use their stuff. And well, they said, yeah, <laughs> just, but, but it's, it's like, it's like Glenn told me, he said, one day their stuff will become your stuff because you're going to figure out how they're doing it and you're going to start doing it on your own. So, um, you know, master classes in, I mean, sometimes, sometimes copying other people's thing is not the coolest thing to do in the whole world. But in this instance, it really is. And I still have notebooks at home buried somewhere that have my notes listening. And, and you were talking about clear channels. I, one of my favorite stations to listen to was KOMA out of Oklahoma City. And you yeah. can pick that up in Dillon. Clear as, clear as a bell. Clear as a bell. Just like, it, just like we were in downtown Oklahoma City. And, you know, the cool thing is, is like you said, you'd listen to other ones. But that's given you your foundation, which you build your brand off of. Exactly. So, I mean, you know, it's just, and the thing that's blowing my mind, like how you guys had the engineers and you guys had all this stuff, you know, in modern days with what we have in the studio today here in front of us, we could start a radio station on air. Well, it, it's like, yeah, all you need is, a, is something to, well, just an MP3 player or something yeah. like that for you. But so we had, we didn't, we had cassettes but I don't believe they were set. I don't think we'd use any cassettes for on-air stuff. All our tape stuff was reel-to-reel. -reel. And, and the carts, the things the commercials were on, were like a, um, about the size of a mini 8-track, probably about like this. Yeah. And you had the cart machines. And the bigger stations, like when I worked at the bigger stations, you would put the cart in, and you when you made your commercial... 
you automatically put a tone on the end so the top commercial would uh, when it was done it would automatically start and go down we didn't have that at KDBM, so we had to sit there with our finger on each one and when it was over <laughs> with. And all commercials are labeled. If you've seen if you've ever seen a cart, it'll it'll say it'll say so Southwest Montana News and it'll say one thirty second. And it'll have a number, which your account number is fourteen, so it'll have a big fourteen on the front yeah. and that's listed. And then and then there's an outtake. And and Glenn, did we have a set number? How how many of the words of the last of the last commercial did we of the of the commercial did we have to put on that outtake? Was it four, four or five? I, I think it was a phrase. I, I don't remember how long. Uh, maybe I don't know. Maybe three or four, depending on how well we knew it to begin with. Yeah, and most of the time it was an address, yeah. so it was easy yeah. to remember. But jingle, mm-hmm. if it was, if we were playing a Coca Cola, oops, that's okay. You can product say it product placement. Yeah, you can say it. If we if we had a Coca Cola commercial, or not the it, radio, it would say jingle out. <laughs> yeah, and so you would have to, and you you had to pay attention. I mean, nowadays, now now in radio, you can sometimes get a little lackadaisical because everything is so. It's a lot automated. E- yeah, yeah. But in those days, you had to be careful. You had to stick right there. And if you got, it's like, and then queuing up records. You know, if you, if anybody's ever watched the show WKRP in Cincinnati, <laughs> the Great Turkey Drop. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is. It is very, very similar to actual radio at those times, except for one thing. You can't just put a turn. You can't just drop the turn. You know the, the tone, yeah. the arm. And just have it be right there. We had to cue it up. And re- re- remember, Glenn, we could always tell the popular sure. records because they yeah. had the little scratches in the front of it. Because you would cue mm-hmm. it up so much, you would go roop, 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 like mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. The amazing part is, is I'm like listening to these stories. And it just kind of, it shows like, because I can remember, you know, a radio DJ was just as popular as like a TV person at the time. You know, I'm listening to your guys' stories and the amount oh, of work that so many doors. Yeah, and the amount me. of work that you guys would have to do to make these programs and stuff and like how you guys were talking about the city boy and the country boy. Did you guys <laughs> write out your program or did you guys just kind of play off of one another? You know, I wish I could have said that we wrote our script out and we were well scripted, but we mostly winged it. And uh, we couldn't have done that if Lee Barker hadn't been as smart as he was. I mean, he 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 could pick up any thread and make a sweater out of it. Uh, yeah. So, I um, there he has he had a real gift, and so many of the people that were there had their own gift in so many ways. Wally among them. Uh, that uh, yeah. It was a labor that we had been working at, really, all, preparing for all our lives. Well, and it's so. a true labor of love for you guys. I mean, I still see it today in Wally, you know, like when he started coming in and we started doing the Did You Know South, but, well, it was originally Did You Know Dylan, you know, and you could just see the spark come back in Wally, and it's just like talking to you guys and, you know, with me starting this and then seeing what you guys um, you know, with Bert and like the radio station and how everything was ran, it's just it blows my mind to think like modern day how much he's here they have it. Because... You know, take that back one level to when Bert came to Dylan to start a radio station. Uh, I mean, true, he had some family backing from his wife's family and her brother, who was the city attorney in Dylan, but he had his own background in radio, Armed Forces Radio in Korea, and he'd gone to broadcast school, and he thought he was ready to do that, but just the enormity of what was in front of him, and he, he just walked into it and kept walking. Yeah. Uh, built that radio station, uh, went on the air in January of 57, and, and in February of 57, his brother-in-law, who was his partner in Vigilante Broadcasting, uh, was a pilot in a plane that crashed and he was killed in the night of past and and Bert and Peggy were just pretty much on their own and and they took that and and uh, really 
created their own little radio empire, which is, still exists today. And to me, uh, he, he, he just exhibited all the hallmarks of people that we designate today as some of the great generation. And, you know, it's country. it's amazing, too, because, like, I'm listening to this, and you guys are listing these people and how they went off to have these great careers and to think that it all started in, you know, in Dillon. And you guys, Bert taught you guys something that stuck with all you guys throughout your life to make you that successful, you know, and to implant that into younger generations, you know, like Wally talking about, like, how he forgot to shut the mic off and, you know, a, a good leader is somebody that knows how to teach lessons without making you feel like you're a failure. And that's what spurs you on to go. And, you know, calling Wally and saying, Wally, your mic's on and hanging up that right there was probably <laughs> more powerful of a learning tool than anything else he could have did. And well, you know, he's still telling the story. He yeah. got fired. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. You know, and and he, you know, and he remembered that. He remembered that story when I talked to him. He remembered exactly when it happened. So. Yeah, and to think like all this came out of little old Dylan. You know, one guy's dream and what it like implanted in these people and it just spread, you know, and that's just, to me, that's the amazing part is, you know, as I Here do stories, as, as I do I these watch. stories, they just kind of, you know, they make me more proud of where I'm from. And like listening to you guys talk about this, you know, to me, it was just a radio station growing up. You know, you turned it on, you listened to it. But as I'm hearing these stories, now I'm thinking, oh, that radio station, you know, and what it did for these people, it's just amazing. Glenn, you were, yeah, you were on your way to... It gave everybody an opportunity to uh, be who they were. And I mean, he, like I said before, even he had a way of building you up, even when you thought he was holding you back. We we made minimum wage, just that. I mean, if we worked overtime, we we got paid for the overtime, but we didn't get paid overtime. Yeah. We got the minimum wage, and you know, he was you know everybody that worked there said, well, boy, he's tight. Uh, he's he's he watches every nickel and dime. <laughs> well, I I had a car and it threw a rod. And uh, he said, uh, I'll co-sign a note for you if you want to buy a car. I'm like, you you what? I mean, I, I, I came from a situation just like Bert's. Uh, m my folks couldn't sign a note for me, co-sign a note to buy me a car. But he said, I'll co-sign a note for you to buy a car. So I went down and bought a car, paid $1,900 for a new car. <laughs> Times well, have changed. Well, and, and Glenn, you know, we talk about, you know, him starting radio being the, the grandfather of radio. His Beaverhead Madison Hour was uh, probably one of the first and probably one of the best programs in the state highlighting history of southwestern montana i mean you figure when he started that in the it had already started when you got here hadn't it so it had yes, been it had. so yeah. he's got like there's he started in the early 60s and leading up so he still has access to people that were the pioneers. daughters or the sons of people that were pioneers yeah. He's and he gets them in the studio and he talks to them in in, in Madison County in Twin Bridges in Sheridan in Lima in Dell and Armstead before Armstead became the bottom of the lake, you know, and yeah. he, he brought Fort all Curry. Yeah, he yeah. brought all this history to light and um <clears throat> it, it's still it's in reel to reels right now in storage in Red Lodge at his son's place. And I'm thinking if there's any way, I, you know, they don't know what kind of shape the tapes yeah. are in or whatnot, but those would be so much fun and so interesting to listen to again. Cause I didn't, I didn't really appreciate what he was doing. And my grandmother who had told, you know, who is it, who's, I get my history, my love of history from my, my grandparents on my mom's side. She was there too. With yeah. Those people. Yeah, and she said she listened to those programs, and she said these are very good. 
And my grandma was not, didn't say that very often out loud. And it just kind of went, went in one ear and right out the other. And so, and he, he saw, he saw a need and he created that need. I mean, I remember going around the holidays, how many, how many Christmas greetings did we cut for merchants and stuff like that? How many greetings when the class C tournament would come to town? Cause after the new high school gym was built in 68, you know, we hosted the class C tournament when, when the class C had Ennis and twin bridges and mm-hmm. Sheridan, Willow Creek, mm-hmm. Lima, all those, they used to come here. That was where I did my first ball game. I remember growing up, the buses would park in front of our house for class. C yeah. Tournament. yeah. Yeah. That was that. Was, and Glenn, you, I think, I think my first ball game that I did was with you at a class C tournament. I wouldn't be surprised. You know, Bert became famous as a result of a natural event. Uh, in 1959, the Yellowstone earthquake that made Hebgen Dam. Yeah. Quake Lake. He, he was the, he was the voice that was on the scene for that earthquake. Uh, he even went, he even, somebody flew him, uh, into the, the where the mountain had slid off to create the dam, and he he actually had a broadcast. I don't know whether it was it probably wasn't live tape of of uh, flying over that uh, location, but he was on all of the major news networks. I mean, national news networks, uh, not just IMN. Well. Intermountain Network News wasn't on at that time. But uh, CBS, ABC, NBC, uh, all of the uh, reports of the earthquake in Yellowstone was uh, the voice of Bert Oliphant. So, I mean, that had to really up his game, I think, as a uh, personage in radio, uh, especially in Montana. Well, they also in in the same in the same deal, they set up uh, a line, a uh, commercial line for uh, for people that had relatives that had been in that area in the park and were missing. They set up some kind of uh, I don't want to say a helpline, but just a phone line that people could call because they knew that they Bert would find out or Peggy would find out. Or someone would find out from the radio station, and and the same. Yes, that was part of that. And the same with uh, when uh, Bert wasn't around when the when the plane went down when the plane hit the uh, grain bin the grain bin in Labor Day. But the radio station did the same thing then, so he kind of set a precedent precedent of just how valuable a radio is, especially in a small town. And in those days, it was. I still, whenever I hear Booker T and the MGs, Time is Tight, the song Time is Tight, I think of the 1490 uh-huh. Request Club. I hear, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't play Robert Goulet very often at home unless I happen to hear a Christmas song, but I, I think of Robert Goulet. I don't think of Robert Goulet. And uh, so, yeah, radio, radio was fun, and, and it was a great education for me. Um, I learned how to be a writer. Because if you can write a 30-second ad, you can almost write anything. Right, Glenn? You told me that. I remember you saying that. Yes. Once. If, I can write a th- if I can sell something in 30 seconds, I can sell anything. Well, and the genius, like how you were talking, like how he took the paper and he cut it to a certain length. And if you typed it up and it was half that paper, it was 30 seconds. If it took up all the paper, it was a 60-second. I mean... It seems like it's kind of a oddball thing, but I mean, it worked. And I learned how to be a type. Glenn, Glenn, and I were talking about. We learned how to type because I think uh, uh, most people, unless you plan on, you know, having a profession that you need to type a lot, you know, you forget whatever yeah. you learn when you're in. I had Evelyn Stoffer; <laughs> she was my typing teacher at the high school. But you had to type. You yeah. couldn't write stuff out long hair. You or long hair, <laughs> long long hand. You had to type it out. So that helped me over the years. And when I it, we evolved going from computer from uh, typewriters to computers, 
There's no change. It's still a keyboard. Still yep. works the same. Still a QWERTY keyboard. Q W E R T Y. Yep. Yeah. But it, I will. I will. Know, the really neat thing about KDBM is that even as I think of it right now, it was such a magical place. We had all those records. We had access to the the news and the sports and the latest baseball scores and uh, just uh, all kinds of characters. And there were so many interesting characters in and around the Dillon area who would make their appearance at the radio station. A guy brought me a 45 record one time. He said he'd been a federal trapper up in Alaska and he'd written this song for this dog sled race they were going to have. And he wanted me to play it for him. And so I put it on and dropped the needle on it. And from Old Canuck to the Yukon Shore, we've traveled this trail many times before. It was the, the song about the old Iditarod dog sled race, which was nothing then, but now it's, of course, world famous. And here was a guy who'd been there at the beginning of it, from, and, and he was living in Dillon, Montana. Well, there's stories like that. Uh, just everybody that's worked there could tell their own story. But as a, it was a magical place. And, you know, our station was located directly below the transmitter tower, the Wally Old. And you're going to make, make me tell that story, huh? Well, I'll tell you this story. Once during a thunderstorm, I'm standing behind the console, like I do, and I look up to see a small blue globe about the size of a maybe a small soccer ball come out of the transmitter room about four feet off the floor, make a 90-degree turn, go down and up the hall, take a left, and exit through the front screen door. And it just leaves a black smudge on the, where the dust has been on the screen. And it was just scary enough to make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. And I called my dad and told him what I'd just seen. And he said, say no most fire, look it up. And as I think back on my whole four tours of duty at KDBM radio. And I was there four different times. Uh, it was just like that. I mean, it was a, a magical place. Lots of neat things happened and lots of great memories. And uh, Bert was, of course, the guy who put it all in motion. Well, my, my funny, my, my story that, that funny Glenn doesn't mention that this was another one of those little things that they told you about is they said, you want to impress the girls in your life? <laughs> and I'm, okay, oh, wh Wally. what do you mean? And, he and, and I can't remember if it was Glenn or Don Richards, maybe both of them. They reach up above, and they pull, pull the fluorescent light, the long light out, and they walk out, and they stand next to the transmitter, and it lights up in their hand. <laughs> and then they go back in and very nonchalantly put it back in the in the lights fixture and and don't say anything. And I'm sure that the grins were there. They they were just trying. They were really good about not doing it. So I remember the first time I did it, I said, "I'm either going to impress her, or I'm going to be electrocuted." <laughs> <laughs> so, but and, and you know we've been at this for quite a while. So we better we better wrap it up. But we want to. One thing we want to talk about really quick is there, as we talked about, Glenn alluded to all these great, great guys that went off into radio history somehow. Uh, I've talked to a few of them, and what we're thinking about doing is making this uh, somewhat of a regular deal, as far as regular in the in the sense of once a year, and maybe do it around the time of when the radio station signed on in January of 1957. And by way of either direct phone, like we have Glenn on today, or or whether we do phone interviews, and then and then the great Jeremy Engineer puts everything <laughs> together, and we have a program. This this is fascinating stuff. Uh, maybe not for everybody, but it's it's a little bit. It's 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 all our mission statement, Jeremy, and my mission statement for for our, the the program is is to teach people. Uh, 
to remember about what Dylan has been and how it got to where it is right now. And this, you know, Bert, very first radio station. But we talked about Jack Bogut. I brought this book in, Jack Bogut. Uh, he's now retired from KDKA Radio in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He uh, took over for Bert when Bert went to broadcast school to get his, his first class license. Jack ran the station. He had a super uh, great career. You know, Glenn, of course, you know, he came back four different times. I just think he couldn't get radio out of his system. And he was <laughs> he was looking for excuses because he was he was very, very good. He was a good mentor to me in radio. Jack Selway, who Glenn mentioned, who had a, a phenomenal career. Lee Barker. When I went to broadcast school after I graduated from Western in Salt Lake City, Lee was still in Salt Lake City working radio. And I remember going to he let I, I mean we had to get permission for me to go in there and watch him work and it's you know it's masterful to see someone that good work because you just it kind of gets you going don richards the napper in my training session he owns katl radio in mile city he's still involved in broadcasting rod luck uh who was trained by lee graves he went on to a tv career and he was back in dillon a few years ago and told lee that he said Radio is much better than TV. <laughs> um, Dick Brundage, who is now in his 80s, he is still in broadcasting. So there's really no age limit. Lee Graves couldn't make it. He was disappointed. He had a, a shift to fill. He said, I'm too, I get too bored if I sit around being retired. So he's picked up a, another little gig that he works. And of course, Glenn Larriman, myself, and, and the list, the list could probably go on. There's it. There's well, it some, could go on. There's, no question. I mean, there's there's so many so many young college students that spent at least a portion of their collegiate career working at that radio station, and I'm sure they learned as much as we did. Well, I'm Tell uh, Lee Graves, by the way, I appreciate. I uh, wanted to say hi and tell him I I still say that he taught me everything I know, <laughs> and. Uh, I'll do that. I'll walk down and, and stop into his store on the way. But, you know, we were, Glenn, you were, you were a work study kid because you came here on a baseball scholarship and you did work study. You know, as you're talking about the college kids going through radio station, they, they had another form of work study. It was a broadcasting work study that they came through that, that was, uh, that was, uh, mentored by, uh, Bert and Peggy Oliphant. So, um, well, Jeremy, uh, I'm, you let us do most of the talking That's, today. You know what? Um, I, you guys had some amazing stories. And for me, it's just like kind of an honor to be sitting here listening to this past. Because like I said, you know, um, growing up, it was the radio station. Didn't really have much thought into it. And, you know, you'd see like old movies where they kind of made the radio DJs the people that you wanted to be. You know, being a kid of, well, Generation X, where everything changed from cassettes to digital, you know, we got the best of both worlds. We got, you know, yeah. we we got the tail end of vinyl and the tail end of cassettes, and then we were introduced to CDs. And, you know, for a long time, it's kind of funny, because this really opened up my eyes to the world of radio. You know, because I can remember, like, that 70s show, you know, it's when she was on the radio and to her it was a big deal and to me i was like thinking why is that a big deal but if you look at what you guys had to do back then and the licensing that was put into it and how every person on that air had to have a license it had a lot of respect with that title and i don't think that respect follows the title now because people don't realize what the early pioneers had to do to get that like you talking about going out and being able to hold a light in your hand and get it to turn on I mean, you guys worked with a lot of power. You know, it wasn't yeah. something that you just kind of screwed around with and talking about replacing the fuse and ending up on the other side of the room. I mean, this stuff is just stuff I never even thought of when I thought of radio. Well, and, and you talk to anyone who worked in radio probably late 50s into the 70s. They all have stories like that yeah. because radio is was an entirely different profession then. It's still a good medium. It is. It's still it's, a good medium, but it's, I talked to, I talked to Glenn and I talked to 
my I've got a I've got a close friend who was my program director at a station in Boise, and we still stay in contact. And uh, he's at he's involved in a in a uh, not a commercial radio station. It's a, it's in their retirement yeah. home retire not retirement home re- retirement community down at sun city they yeah. have their own radio station down there that just broadcasts in he's actively involved in this and he said and he said no matter how hard we try we just we just can't get it out of our system but you always you try and find the one the system that's uh that's close to what it was and yeah. it's never going to be like that and i'm glad i worked that time i'm i'm blessed to have worked radio at that time because i don't think it was the golden age because the people in the 30s and 40s 1930s and 40s might disagree because then that was when radio really really turned it was the all there was yeah, yeah. That, yeah really, that was the you know at night everybody gathered around yep. radio i've got those old radios in here that you know are from that era and they're classic yeah. they're classic so glenn i'm going to wrap things up what did we have to say at the top of every hour because it's it's a little past three o'clock our time. Do you remember what we had to say at the top of every hour before we went into ABC News? This is KDVM Radio fourteen ninety Dillon Montana. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed our uh, our program today on uh, Did You Know Southwestern Montana on behalf of Jeremy, myself, and our very special guest Glenn Laram. Good day. Good day. <laughs>